Hey everybody, welcome back to the Quest for the Bestest. It's the podcast for Backlog Banter where we look at every single Best Picture winner, rank them, and decide which one is the very best. We've got a great big list, and today we are going to add one more film to the list. It's Man with a Man for All Seasons is our film today, directed by Fred Zinneman, starring Paul Schofield, Wendy Hiller, Robert Shaw, and Orson Welles, as well as some other people throughout the cast. I am looking forward to hearing your thoughts about this film, because I've got some stored in here. And, uh, and I mean, we just got to get started, except we can't just get started because we have to do a little bit of housekeeping first. I'm so sorry, but not really sorry. Last week, we talked about Terms of Endearment from 1983. We gave it an average score of 7.4, which leads it to go at spot number 49 on the list. So that film, after much, a great big break, took a long time for us to figure out. We had to debate and deliberate. For months, basically, on where that film ended <laughs> it's up. It's a month on the long list. episode. Yeah, it is. It's one. It's the longest episode we've episode ever done for all seasons. <laughs> but now we're back in the swing of things. As the seasons change, and as the uh, the dynasty in uh, in England, we'll date this episode a little bit. Pretty precipitous timing, um, in terms of a movie all about the king. And now there is a new king. Hmm. Wouldn't he? Seems wouldn't like he's he... going to do a real good job. The queen is dead. Long live the king, I say. Boys club. Boys, boys, boys. That's what I say. <laughs> That's what Tanner <laughs> says. Well, someone, one of our audience members, I do believe, has something to say about one of the videos we released. Someone has a comment, and someone posted a comment. So why don't we have a little recitation of this. Before the House of Lords, who has what to say? I've got a comment here from uh, from one of our favorite commenters, one Mr. Dan's who uh, commented on our last episode, Terms of Endearment, and he says, I've always enjoyed this film, even though it's not an important film. I'm pretty mm. much in between all of your opinions and understand the, all the points of view except one. <gasps> I am not a Jack Nicholson fan at all. <gasps> He's just Jack Nicholson in almost all of his films. He fit perfectly in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest as well as Chinatown, but for me, he was just okay in this, and his Oscar is baffling. I did love Sherry McLean, and that is the strongest point. So we've, got a, we've got a Jack Nicholson hater in our midst. Wow, oh my God. God. I mean, he's not hes not wrong. Jack Nicholson does just play Jack Nicholson in every movie he's in. <laughs> or is he just really good at playing unhinged? Maybe Jack Nicholson is a fine, well-adjusted individual in real life. None of us know him. I think it's frankly <laughs> offensive to pass judgment on a man we've never That's, met. I've never walked in my Jack own Nicholson, shoes, Tanner. I'm, you are right. Jack <laughs> Nicholson, come on the show, clear the air. I'm calling it, it the ball is in your court, uh, the court of the New York Knicks, a team that he loves. <laughs> oh god <laughs> well just for that tanner i'm gonna punish you you have to give us a plot synopsis of the man for all seasons okay well it's a man for all seasons but it's the, as we know, the movie how could a you man forget for the all title seasons. yeah yeah yeah, yeah the, you have to, you're using the wrong article for our main character thomas moore who is uh a uh a a, a a uh, a consort for the king, a I cardinal, guess. Right? A cardinal, right? Like, he's not a cardinal. I'm not sure. Uh, he's some sort of uh, legal consort for the king, and uh, King Henry the Eighth. That is, uh, all the way back in the uh, early to mid 16th century, uh, when there is a bit of uproar going on in the in in the church and the uh, kingdom of England, wherein. Henry VIII, boy howdy, he wants to marry Anne Boleyn. He's tired of being married to his brother's uh, old wife. And he's like, I want to marry a new a new lady who will give me a son. And the old pope, the old pope with his big old hat, is he's sitting in there, he's saying, na 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 you can't be doing that. And Thomas More, he's sort of caught in the middle of all this, because he's a consort to the king, but he belongs to the church, and he's a, he's a devout Catholic, and he's like, I'm being pulled in two directions here. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try and straight stay the straight and narrow. But with with people on all sides and you know people all out for their own means and ends, that proves harder than uh, harder than Thomas More can maybe be able to handle. And that's what this movie is all about. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So where do we begin with this? Who wants to uh, throw out some initial thoughts on uh, on ye old uh, man for all seasons? The movie's boring. And here's the thing about it. A boring, I think, and somebody said this on Twitter about something. I don't remember who and I don't remember about what. But I'm going to steal the point anyway. Okay. Boring doesn't just refer to pacing sometimes. Like, 
boring is more about sometimes a lack of connection to material, a sort of feeling that there's something tethering you to a narrative or a theme or whatever. And when I say that A Man for All Seasons is boring, I mean it in every sense of the term. Hmm. Principally, I think it's too long. I think that if you made this a, a title 90 minutes, I would have been more engaged. But I think that the larger issue is that in the year of our Lord, 2022, I don't care at all about the upholding of the sanctity of the church. And that is what the movie is predicated upon. If you don't care whether or not Thomas More is going to stand firm in the face of a divorce, then there's really not a whole hell of a lot to grab onto. It's, it's a beautiful period piece. I think the costume's really pretty. I think it sure as hell looks like it's the medieval times, but like the plot is so weirdly predicated upon one man's like final religious stand that I feel like we're... If you don't connect to that, there's nothing here. We don't really see Henry VIII, who is really fun. I think Robert Shaw is really good. We don't see him in, in the old ball and chain, right? We just get this perspective of more, and I think that it's the most boring perspective of this entire crisis. So I was not impressed by the movie at all. I wasn't either. But I, I disagree that it's a, a not very interesting perspective because he's the one that stands out. And I think that's why it's interesting, quote unquote, to write a film about him, write, write a story about this man that sure. is against the face of all, uh, against everything. Sorry. Everything's against him. He's standing up against all odds. It's it's pretty crazy in the world of Thomas More. But the world of Thomas More that is presented in this film isn't interesting because I don't think Thomas More is a very interesting person personality wise. He's very monotone, he's very flat, and he's got his one thing, as that he's not going to move from his morals. We don't really learn too much about him. We don't have a reason to really connect to him. And, and by that metric, I have no reason to really get fully invested in his struggle, which I think is undercut by a couple other things that I definitely want to get into. And I also do think this film is boring visually. It's boring editing-wise. It doesn't really do anything in terms of cinematography. I think whatever transfer we watched was flat, it was gross, the colors were all washed out. And even that, that good production design and the costumes and the set design was just looked boring because there was no depth to anything. There was no flair to the, to the filmmaking. And because of that, everything felt really static. It felt really samey. And I was not involved in the characters. And frankly, I just I think this is one of my least favorite uh, pictures we've seen for, best, for, for this whole show. Not because it's the worst, but because it's just one of the least interesting. Hmm. Well, since Tanner's taken a gigantic gulp of water, I'll go next. Um, I was initially bored by this film, but as it went on and about half an hour into it, I became very wrapped up in the acting and the performances of these characters. And I found myself really, really living in and quite enjoying the deliveries um, that all of the actors in this film give. And having that provide just enough of a through line and a, and a connection point for me to become interested within the whole film. And I enjoyed it enough. I don't think it was like mind altering or, you know, world shattering of a film, but I thought it was entertaining. I quite liked the look at this, you know, old civilization, old England, Henry VIII's time to see the way that like everyone is pressured and kind of some people like push back on it and, you know, they have to, they can't push back on it, but they kind of like give each other side eye glances. And um, while our, well, Thomas More in the middle is this, you know, very kind of stoic character. And I agree, he's a little one dimensional. He only, ha he only really does his one thing, which is his silence. But I find the moments where he is like outwitting in court, those to be quite entertaining and kind of gratifying as he like runs circles around all of the other lawyerly people. Um, with his superior understanding of everything that is going on and how he can basically get out of it without being on too much of people's bad sides until the very end, of course, in which he's killed. But I think that the plot is... it. it there is something there for me in what's going on with this man who will who is standing up to everybody. And I think that's at least somewhat interesting. Timo, thank you for calling attention to my strategically placed drink of water there because I thought I was placing myself to go last because I thought I thought I was going to be the sole somewhat defender of this film. But it's glad to I'm glad to see that I have a 
fellow somewhat defender of this film because Demo, you know, that's ba- those are basically my thoughts. I thought this one was pretty solid, actually. Um, I really love Thomas More's character. I think he's very well portrayed by Paul Schofield, uh, and there are a menagerie of uh, supporting performances like Robert Shaw as Henry VIII, uh, and you know, um, even like um, John Hurt as Richard Rich. Uh, uh, I forget what his name is, but the guy who plays Thomas Cromwell uh, as well, uh, the the Would Duke he... of Norfolk as well. Mm-hmm. I think I think these are all it's Leo really McCurr, in... by the way. Thank you. Uh, I think these are all some some interesting pieces on the chessboard of this pivotal moment in human history, in the history of Western civilization. And maybe maybe my enjoyment of this uh, uh, flowered even more from the fact that we just got done talking about this period of time in one of my classes, where you know we were coming out of the Protestant Reformation and the two dominant power structures in the western world the catholic church and the and the state the government the the royalty the kingdom of england were were warring with each other essentially in sort of backhanded ways that are that they were trying to outmaneuver one another to become the overall the one that out that outpowered the other and position themselves as the dominant Western power structure. And what we have in the caught in the middle here, as I said in my beautiful synopsis of the film, is Thomas More, a man that is purely 100% defined by his sense of conscience, by his sense of moral right and wrong. And that's something that he sees, and as we come to find out, is lacking in the in the church and in the kingdom of England. Because all these people are out for political end goals. You know, we have... Uh, Henry VIII, uh, who is o- only trying to outmaneuver the the the, the Church of England, or sorry, the, the Catholic Church, to get himself a male heir to carry on the Kingdom of England, to carry on his bloodline, and the Catholic Church is only trying to do this so they are not, you know, they're the the what eventually became the Anglican Church, the the Church of England, does not pull away parishioners from the Catholic Church. Uh, and, you know, sort of undermine their political and religious power. And I think that Thomas More is a very interesting figure to put in all of this. And Paul Schofield, uh, he, he, well, first of all, let me back up. He's a very well-written character. I love all of the sort of professions of his conscience and how his conflict is written in this film when he, when he's had in those conversations with Henry VIII, with his friends like the Duke of Norfolk, and um, also how sort of when he becomes... Uh, metastasized in his conscience how he says those things as well like in the court scene at the very end I think is a fantastic scene so that this film is uh, not without its flaws of course but I think it really uh, centers around a good a well-written character in Thomas More and a good performance from Paul Schofield I would like to begin by talking about our main character because I think he's the driving force of the whole film but um, that's right Tucker before we do there, just a quick side. This is, and it said so in the beginning of the film, um, an adaptation of a play by Robert Bolt. And to me, this does feel like an exercise mm-hmm. for actors to play around in and to have these just like really, really big moments. And I quite appreciate how, even though because it's a play that, adapted from a play it lends the film to be very dialogue heavy and very you know i don't know if i would say static but it definitely plays out in a way that is reminiscent to theater um but to me that kind of is situated within it within the film in a spot that like allows these the my favorite elements to really shine through um being the acting and i think the dialogue the 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 period writ, written dialogue is very very I thought was very entertaining to listen along to and not just like kind of like half understand and then use my intuition and my knowledge to figure out what the rest of it was meaning. Cause it's a little translating it, from British. Yes. Translating <laughs> from British into regular English. Yeah. Uh-huh. But I, I mean, if you guys want to talk about that or we can talk about our main man, Thomas. Um, well, I do I think the, the two uh, are, go ahead, Tucker. I, I think the two are intrinsically connected because his performance and his dialogue is the draw of this film. And he was also um, the person that played, or so uh, uh, Paul Schofield played Thomas More in the stage version of this play. So he's very mm-hmm. experienced in this role and it makes sense that he was cast. Um, and in those moments that he's giving these long dialogues, I, I do like these sequences where he's 
professing his opinions, but I find it very hard to connect to because I think uh, what what Abram said is, is very salient, at least in my opinions, is there's I, I don't understand what his position is and why his morals are the way they are, except the the church believes this. And because the church believes this, I believe this, but I don't even really know exactly what the church believes except for to not let Henry do this. And because I don't feel any sense of personal uh he doesn't feel like he has a personal stake in it because of, of his own morals. It feels like it's just the church sort of puppeting his mind to do this. I never felt like through his dialogue, I was getting more about him as a person, just as an extension of the Catholic church. If that makes sense. Uh, I would disagree. I don't think, I don't really view Thomas More as a puppet, as an extension of the Catholic uh, school of thought in this at all, really, which is really interesting because he does hold the Catholic view of of this whole issue in his mind, but in he but the the writing of the film frames it in such a way as it is not he's not uh, his moral point isn't the church says X so I believe X. There is a, actually explicitly a line of dialogue that says that where he says something uh, uh, something 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 that I or not that I believe but that I believe. And that's something that's really interesting, I think, is that it's not coming from a belief system. It's from his own sense of moral right and wrong. And that is what I think is, is all is what Thomas More is all about in this film, not just blindly following the Catholic Church. In fact, that's what uh, Henry VIII um, says about him uh, in their conversation is that he says, you're not a blind follower. That's why I entrusted you with this position. You are a man who is clearly defined by his own morals. And if those align with the Catholic Church, so be it. If those align with the with the, the, the Kingdom of England, so be it. And I think that's why um, I really enjoyed Thomas More's writing and Paul Schofield's performance in this, is that I think that comes across very well. I think the film yeah. kind of weaves... I'll be very quick for you before you... Weaves in no, between um, telling, like, hiding his... Thomas More's like real thoughts about it and then developing and like hinting at his real thoughts as we move along until we get to the climactic final scene. I think that that's part of his change as a character is us learning more about how he really thinks deep down. And because I, I do agree that we don't at the beginning see a lot. And, and it, I think I can see where you're coming from, Tucker, about why you'd believe that he is is just following the church. But I think that the film develops him as it moves along into his like very own particular, you know, his own sense of conscious and his own sense of duty almost in his silence. Yeah, I think I think what you guys are saying puts a lot of my issues and some of my praises for the movie kind of right in my crosshairs here. And, okay. I'll, and I'll talk about that because I, I think that, Timo, you're definitely right. When I was engaged by the film, it was by principally the last act. As we're seeing him these, do these sort of rhetorical like gymnastics around people in the courtroom when he's being yanked out again to try to get to sign the oath and everything, right? Because then I think we start to recognize, contrary to what you were saying, Tucker, that he is really here because he believes something. And at, and at a point, I think towards the end of the film, it becomes more than just, I'm making a stand for the sanctity of religion and turning down bribes and justice and X and Y and Z. He still does, you know, he still prays to Jesus to save his life at the end, and it is obviously a very religiously wrought film, but I think we get a little bit more about sort of him as an intellectual, opposed to just him as a mouthpiece for the Lord when we get towards the end of the film. But we spend so long not doing that, that I get, I, I found myself off the train by the time that I felt like I wanted to be on it. What, what I mean is the, the first, when it really is more about, here's the interplay between the king and the church, and the bribery, and the duties, and the heretics, and everything. We spend a lot of time sort of like, I'll use your, your chess board, board analogy, Antenna. We spend a lot of time like setting up the pieces and where they mm. go, right? But for me, it feels like that's too much. Because I'm not interested in the sanctity of the church. I'm not interested in its interplay with the king and everybody and the duties of the role. What I'm interested in, as it not as, I should, I'm not a religious person at all, so that's certainly sort of coloring my perspective. But when that religion is brought into conversation with Thomas's sense of right and his personal struggle after he's been thrown in prison, that's when everything comes into better focus for me and when I'm more engaged by what's going on. Sure. Because it's sort of just like the, the period era setup 
it feels like it is lacking a lot of the sort of political context you are giving us, Tanner, mm. to where it's been a long time since I got an OK score in, a- in, in AP European history, right? <laughs> yeah. So I was, you know, not that engaged because even before we centralize the plot in everything on Thomas, he's still centralized in what could have been a tighter sort of establishment of the larger political situation instead of always filtering it through his perspective because I don't think his perspective gets interesting. I don't think that dialogue really gets that compelling until he's already in prison. Mm, yeah, sure. And, and I think that's maybe what, maybe I didn't frame my my critique clearly enough. And I think it's the, the fact that I don't connect to, or I don't, frankly, I'm not familiar enough with the church's morals on this perspective to really understand what's the grounding his perspective, because obviously his his morals, his history comes from this is what the church is teaching him, and this is that's what shapes his belief. And then, of course, that's that's very natural for a lot of people who are religious, and I'm not disparaging that. But I think my problem comes in that I don't really feel like he has too much of his own personality until you get to the end. He is a very monotone character, and he is presented, and I think this is a huge detriment to my connection to the film, he's presented as this paramour of good. And frankly, there's not that much nuance to him as a person. He makes decisions that are his decisions, and they're good, and they're good, and they're good, and they're good. And he's and he's just on that track until he literally dies, until everyone stands against him and they kill him. And because there's not some extra layer to him or an explanation of why he's this way, or, or even a conflict between that when it comes to his family. Of course, they don't want him to die, but he, he never really has this other element to his personality for me to feel like he's more than just an extension of the church until the end when he is using his legalese, which I think is maybe the other aspect of his personality is that he is a lawyer and he understands sort of the legal system. But to me, that's, that's more of a a professional element to his personality. I don't really feel like I know the person Thomas more. I know the lawyer Thomas more. And because of that, he feels very static. He feels very stale. He's, he's stiff in his, proceedings for the entire duration of the film and he, he just doesn't feel unchanging which is not a very interesting way to portray a protagonist in my opinion. hmm um yeah go what, ahead Timo. what i was when you talk about him having like two sides of the character to me uh, the film essentially boils down to that the king basically from the first time they meet wants him to do something that he doesn't want to do and for me that moment of connection is fairly early in the film it's right after orson wells dies and it's like oh there is it's it's been set up there's this divorce that the the chancellor that um more doesn't want to like go through with the divorce and that the previous chancellor kind of didn't want to do it either and then so that then when the king comes and there's this fiery conversation where they talk to each other that's that moment where i'm like okay it's the king versus more and to me like more's other side of his not necessarily. I think the other side of his character is King Henry VIII trying to force him into doing this, going against his conscience. And he is the one who stays true to his conscience the whole time. And that's his internal character struggle throughout the whole film is that like literally everyone is telling him to go otherwise. Um, and the point of him dying in the end is to really be like the king is to, I think, hammer home this old idea of what the king's power really was and that the king wanted to become supreme ruler of this of the religion and so he did and he wanted to be divorced so he did and that all who stood in his way even those of perfect conscience and of perfect you know spirit and everything would just be bulldozed over and unable to even you know contradict him or do anything really against the king without facing death and so this like larger narrative of like absolute power i think is what became interesting to me and is what i take away from the film you know tanner brings up the context of it's the church versus the state and in this the state wins out sort of by co-opting the church but it's these displays of big power that then get shown down on one single person that kind of that were bringing me in um certainly by the end of the film, but I I was receiving enough hints and being telegraphed basically what what was going going to be happening earlier in the film that was enough to bring me in and keep me interested. Yeah, Um, I I, Timo, I I think you bring up a solid point there is that, you know, uh, Thomas More is sort of this this very small figure, this pawn in between the two giant forces that are the state and the church. 
And um, I think he, you, you get a good sense of his fear of, of his insignificance, uh, or re- really, his insignificance in one on one hand, but his significance on the other, because he is a figure in the in, in both of these places. But he just wants to live his life. He doesn't want to get caught up in the in this huge scenario. He doesn't want to have to make a statement on X or Y or in, in favor or not in favor of these things. That's why he chooses to remain silent for so long. I think it's yes, out of his survival instinct, out of understanding the system, and uh, not only understanding that he can say st- stay silent to not reveal his position and re- and keep him himself and his family safe, but also for fear of his life and his family's life and their well-being and things like that, which, of course, comes around and uh, when when he's thrown in prison, which is maybe why um, you guys connect to that a bit more, because that's when that kind of gets thrown out the window, in, in a sense. Uh, but, and that's when sort of his witticism comes out as well. I think I think Thomas More is a very... Uh, a very witty character uh, that comes across in in scenes where you know he's being cross examined in that like dungeon esque room where right. they're trying to like find loopholes in the things that he's saying to try and convict him or in the climactic scene in, when he's on trial that sort of show fake trial where where Richard Rich gives false testimony to condemn him. I think that um, I do get a sense of a number of aspects of Thomas More's character, his fear his conflict about why he believes the things he believes and if he should just give in because that's how people survive in this scenario is just rolling over and chasing their own political ends or, you know, in his witticism in, in trying to outsmart these people when he realizes that he's sort of, that the walls are closing in around him. I think I get a sense of a number of these things, not only through Thomas More's writing, uh, but also through the portrayal by Paul Schofield. I just want to yeah, throw I- in... Oh, I here here I go again, Abram. I go for it. Just very quickly, Tucker, you mentioned um, about the feeling about the the like professional and the personal and the political different sides of Thomas More, and how you didn't really feel the personal side very much, right? And so, um, but I was thinking, to me, the way that this political system works is that when we're shown this in the scene when Henry VIII comes to visit, when um, that the personal and the political are very, very intertwined, and they're almost impossible to separate. Kind of hence why they go that the, the, the family is brought in and so important with in, when Thomas More is deciding if he's going to make a statement or not, or you know what he will do. That just something to throw in there that I think that the that scene really shows us this dynamic that you cannot separate the two of them in this particular society of uh, Tudor England. Well, I think you're right, Timo. I think that's a really good sequence if we're going to talk about scenes that compelled me prior to his arrest i think that's a great example of it because i think what that scene does is put what you guys are saying into a a real concrete situation in which there is somebody that represents the the monarchy and that is Mm -hmm. the king i think part of the problem with sort of my attachment to these themes of sort of the political absolutist power of the king or whatever is because the king is largely absent. I think that you draw into much clearer illustration these sort of conflicts within Thomas when he has an antagonist to be going against. And that's what I think makes that scene with the king quite good because, and I agree with you, I think the editing of Tucker is very weird in this movie and we can talk about it, but but I think it was really effective to cut between this huge booming performance from, Mm -hmm. from Robert Shaw, which I loved, into the into the feast room and everybody's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to be doing, right? It's like listening <laughs> to your parents fight. It's very yeah. weird. And I think that's really effective to sort of sort of crystallize the the sort of immature, I don't really give a hoot, uh, a opinion of the king of the the my old shovel of a wife isn't giving me a son, right? So so I need to marry Anne. And I think that when you can really see that tension is when you see on Thomas's face, yeah, damn, I'm putting a lot of people in jeopardy by not doing this. But that the illustration of that conflict is really effective, and I think that's why those scenes at the end of the film are equally effective, because that becomes very clear. Here is a court that really isn't here to render any sort of justice. They're just here to exercise the power of the king. 
But I think even those sequences would have been stronger, even if we just had Robert Shaw just, you know, sitting in his chair singing, oh, g- goodbye and, f- and adieu, ye fair, ye sweet, sweet Thomas, whatever. I'm trying to make a Jaws joke, I forget. Sweet, sweet <laughs> summer child. Yes. But, but I just think that that's part of my issue. You guys are right that these political undercurrents are there, these interpersonal undercurrents are there. But I don't think that the film provokes situations enough that illustrate that beyond mm. a sort of like inferential sort of extra knowledge situation of I knew these these conflicts. When I think of the strength of this movie, I think of Thomas is put in a situation where he can be witty or where he's really on his face fighting for his life. Like there's really interesting remarks in that scene with the king where he's like, they're talking about the king's music. And then then Thomas is like, I, I like the music, but I am known to have very poor judgment on that front. The king's like, well, you like it, so we're one and the same, right? Like, seeing him try to jab at the king, seeing him try to defend himself and, and rout this humongous figure, that's really effective. And I think that's way better as a grounding device for me as an audience member than this sort of amorphous concept that the state can do whatever the hell you want to, to, mm. to people. That's when I think the movie's actually working for me. I, I, I really do agree, and I think that the lack of presence of robert shaw's king henry the anthony is, is what, another one of my problems with this film is because that scene where he gets off the boat and he gets in the mud and they're like how do we react to this and he starts laughing that's that's the best moment in the movie i'm pretty much barred out of my um because robert shaw as king henry VIII brings what this movie is severely lacking in my opinion which is energy the moments that he's on screen i feel like there's a person with personality on the screen and not just a, a political puppet which is how i feel the vast majority of, of the characters represented, at least in my opinion. Um, and I really wish that the film had been more divided in terms of screen time between what King Henry VIII wants and then the people close around him and then putting that in conversation, more stronger in conversation uh, with what Thomas More believes. Because I think the fact that we focus so hard on Thomas More's beliefs and because essentially, in my opinion, he doesn't really change across the course of the film, I'm, I'm spending most of the film waiting to get to those moments where it's brought into conversation with the people that are, are are in the higher places of power. Of course, that's a lot of the scenes, but where he's against someone interesting, frankly. And, and, and I do want to start shifting the conversation a little bit to my other my other big criticism of the film, which is the filmmaking behind it. And I do think that that's a severe detriment to my engagement with the film because the film is so lacking in energy in a lot of its filmic components. Like there isn't much reason why this film is a film as opposed to a play because it's so focused on that dialogue. But I really thought the, the cinematography was, was hmm. flat and bland. I thought I'm, the, I'm the kind of curious as to where you watched it. Cause the version that I watched did not have flat cinematography. I thought the color was very, very I thought it looked very good too. I thought, I thought we that watched it on a library DVD. So I, I rented mine and I, I put it up on the projector and even in, it was the middle of the day when I was watching it on the projector and it, if it, that we have an old and dim projector, um, it was still able to, I, the, the film looked quite good and I quite enjoyed this realistic aspect of how dark so many scenes were. It's just very, very, hmm. whenever they're inside, it's just very dark. And to me, I was like, ah, that's realistic. They don't have lights in the 16, <laughs> you know, the 16th century England they have candles, and those don't make a lot of light. And so I found myself being very engaged, and I was a little surprised we don't see this kind of like very high key lighting from the '60s. And then once we get into scenes um, in the courtroom, I thought that the camera was there are some very nice shots in there of camera moving around, interesting f- angles and framing of all these characters that are sitting and the parties that are interested in what's going on in the courtroom and reactions and whatnot. And so while I I will say I wasn't like amazed. The entire time with the the filmmaking, I wasn't ever distracted as a, in like a bad way from it. Well, that is severely not my experience, and frankly, to a, a very detrimental aspect of, of yeah. Yes, it was the transfer, and I admitted that flat out. For one of the first things I mentioned to Tanner, I'm like, I, I don't know if it's the film, I don't know if it's the transfer, but what we are watching is gray. It is flat. The lighting has no depth to it, and frankly, that really disconnected me from the quality set design and costumes. And I think that the other element of lack of energy in the, in the filmic components is there's basically no score to this movie. And so, so many of the scenes, you're just sitting there in silence as you're waiting for the next person to say something about politics in old British language. And because of that repetition and the lack of momentum that would be added by a more present score, I was always just 
I felt like there was something like literally missing from the film. Like I know I could be feeling something here, but because there's no music, I'm just waiting for something to happen. Yeah, I think I think it's a I think it's a very nice looking movie. I rented on Amazon for like three bucks, four bucks, I don't know, but it looked very nice on my monitor. And then when Jean asked me to come sit in bed with her and watch it on my laptop too, I thought it, I thought it was quite a pretty movie. I think there's something very natural about the aesthetic, as as Timo was saying, but I think that also extends sort of just the the vibes of the movie. There are a lot of quite long takes. I think about just as the movie's beginning, we're just watching a guy row a boat, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think that it very early on sets the tenor for what the film is going to be and how it's going to proceed. Now, I don't think that it's a very engaging tenor, but I think that the film is deliberate in its in how sparse it is sonically in terms of the the camera. Timo, I, I the, the camera work is okay. I, there's a lot of very smooth, very nice pans and things like that. I think it establishes very early on that this is a movie that is going to pre- present England in this natural way, and we're just gonna we're just gonna rock with it. And I think that's okay. I think that stylistically, the movie is totally fine. And foreground and dialogue is not something I typically take an issue with. What I do take an issue with on a filmic side, though, is the editing, because I think that some of the cuts in the film leave me wondering if I'm supposed to be laughing or not. And there's two examples I think of. The first one is when we have um, Thomas talking to his wife about, like, there's never going to be a new whatever the hell Orson Welles is. Not a cardinal. He's never going to be a new mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. Cut and, he, cut, and he's dying on a table, right? Yeah. And then cut again, and, and, and Thomas is, is, is getting coordinated. Or mm-hmm. I think about the, ooh, t- lit- like, literally him and his daughter, uh, what are her name, Matt... Ma- Margaret. Margaret. The Meg. The Meg. Both the Meg. Sweating profusely as I meet on the road, and he goes, Man, I really hope I can sign that oath, and it cuts and he's in jail. Like, th- th- there's this sort of feeling on the character's side of speculation of, Oh, this isn't going to happen. Oh, I hope this is going to happen. But then, sort of, the, the filmic direction says, But it's going to happen literally after a hard cut. And to mm-hmm. me, it's. Wait. It sounds like a, it almost feels like a punchline. Right, it feels like a punchline. It feels like we should have a slide whistle as he's being thrown in prison, and and <laughs> I, it just leaves me in a position where it feels like we're missing that moment to speculate and to humanize and feel the emotions of Thomas being like, "Oh fuck, Orson Welles is dead," so that means I have to be I'm next in line, or "Oh my god," doing the the sweating meme of you know the guy toweling off his forehead mm-hmm. looking at the oath or whatever like there's moments here that i think that the editing just says eh, go around it it's fine and to me that strips out it, t- it takes me out of the experience and i think it strips out moments to get in the psyche of our characters a little bit more yeah sure i mean we we, we uh, again we have the classic abram buner thing of like i wish this movie was shorter but also i wish we had these ce- these extra scenes that would have made the movie <laughs> longer but regardless sure. uh, i don't disagree with you guys either i i i don't i don't i don't think that the editing is particularly good um, and even all the praises that I've been levying at this movie, I did want to point out that I don't think the movie really gets going until Robert Shaw shows up. I think that's, yeah. the, that, that's when the movie kind of gets a, gets a kick and in the proverbial hiney and to get into kicking in the fifth film. gear. Yeah, yeah exactly. I was going to say, it's more than a half an hour into the movie is when it begins. I will, yes. uh, if, we, if we're airing other grievances, I will say these side characters really don't do a lot for me. Um, mm-hmm. What's his name? Our, our other, our second guy. Um, we, Tom Cromwell? No, no, Cromwell. <laughs> Thomas Cromwell. <laughs> Thomas Cromwell. Cromwell. I really, I think Leo McKern is fantastic. I think he's great because yeah. he's just evil, and and that those performances are just being thrown there. In this movie, he's just evil, right? And mm-hmm. in real life, he Cromwell, interesting character. You can Google him on your own time. Um, no, I'm talking about. Well, I guess the Duke of Norfolk. I kind of liked him, but Richard, yeah. but Richie Rich. And um, Rich. and whatever and Roper, oh son Roper, Will Roper. Those two characters yeah. really were just they felt interchangeable but different and important to know the difference, even though the film both actor and costume and action wise does not differentiate those two people very well. And so I just felt very unsupported by our supporting cast. They were just kind of yeah. there while our main characters were like throwing out these performances that I was being wowed by. Everyone else is like, okay, well, whatever. Old Richie Rich was basically like, "Give me a job," and everyone's like, 
no. And then he went to the bad guys, and he's like, give me a job. And they're like, all right, fair enough. If you promise to be a bad guy, he's like, I guess I will. And then, uh, he again, he doesn't get interesting until he gives the false testimony. But again, I feel like that's that that's a bit lacking in weight because he's like sort of looking at uh, at Thomas More as he's, as he's saying these things, kind of like he's, uh, I don't know, like Peter, like, 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 Peter denying Jesus uh, in the Bible or something like that, but I'm like, th- these guys didn't really know each other ultimately. Like he worked, th- Richie Rich's been working for the bad guys for most of this movie, so I mean, uh, sure, he, he probably had regrets about it, about lying under oath and stuff like that, but yeah, perjuring, um, per- perjuring, perjuring himself, anarchy. perjuring. Uh, yeah, there's an um, inference though. There's an inference that they have a relationship, and I think that's what's interesting oh, yeah. about both of the characters that you guys are talking about. Uh, it's, it's not Hooper, but I've got Jaws on the head. Roper. 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 Yeah. Yes. We we bas- we basically get we basically get both of them, Richie Rich and then Roper back to back with the sort of mm-hmm. Thomas telling uh, Rich, "Hey, go work at the school, right?" And there's this sort of feeling that this is not the first time they've had this conversation. And then we we come into the house and it's oh, uh, Margaret is sitting there with with Roper. And then these... I can't believe my daughter's dating a Lutheran. Well, no, that's not the Lutheran. Yeah. He becomes this sort of like firebrand anti church establishment character. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, You can't the marry. Next time you see him. Yeah, you can't marry Margaret until you're no longer a Lutheran. And he's like, God, fuck the Lutherans, right? Am I, am uh-huh. I right, Thomas? Those <laughs> Lutherans. And, that, and that's his character. And, and the same thing with, with Rich, he's like, He's like he's like syndrome. He, his hero told him no, and then he becomes bad, and there's nothing else that goes on. But unlike syndrome, there's not that moment to understand ever, right? Mm. And when we get close to it, I think you're right, Tanner. But that scene lacks the weight of a re- developed relationship. And I think it, 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 Tanner, you're right because I can never. I'm a wishy washy idiot. I can never decide if a movie is too long or too short. But right. what I what I can't put my finger on the pulse of is the fact that it feels weirdly paced and how. We, mm-hmm. we get information. And I think that we, we get, like, the end points of these two characters' relationships to Thomas, but it's that stuff in the middle that makes them interesting. So I would have, I certainly would have cut down that supporting cast to, like, yeah. Alice. <laughs> Just was, Alice. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of, I, I I did like her as well. I, I, I love this stuff when uh, he's in prison and they all come and they're like, Great scene. Hey, man. Just like, just like, take the oath. It doesn't really matter. They're like, oh, begging him. He's like, they are going to kill you. They're gonna find a way, or they're just gonna keep you here for the rest of your life. And event, like, he he just like says a couple things. He says a couple things to him because I think he's a, you know, he's a he's a well spoken character. He's a witty character. And they're all like, well, we tried, but like, obviously, he's set down this moral path, and we understand it. And yeah, we should probably get out of here, lest the uh, the wrath of the king fall on our heads too. Uh, in more ways than one, wink, wink, if you remember the ending of this film. Um, but I do want to, uh, I want to circle back around just quickly to sort of the, uh, the visual language of the film, because it's not flashy at all. Zinnemann is one of those, you know, like, old school Hollywood directors where he's like, I'm here to shoot the characters and not really add a lot for myself, uh, because I'm, that's just, that's the job that I have. But I do want to shout out the the nice um, light motif, I suppose, of juxtaposing the uh, like the the king's gargoyles and stuff like that on his castle with uh, with nature. I think that's something that's interesting, um, and, I, and I think that sort of is supposed to signify like the conflict between the uh, rigid, cold, sort of dead inside. Uh, laws that are both being enacted by the Catholic Church and by the Kingdom of England uh, versus sort of like the n- natural moral, well, of course, as we know, you know, the, Thomas More is largely getting his moral direction from the Catholic Church, but it, it's, it, we're supposed to understand that, that it's more personal for him than that, you know, then, it, so that is, a, that is juxtapos- juxtaposed with the sort of natural morals of nature that we get, uh, that we're supposed to associate with Thomas More, I suppose. I had something to say. I can't, I can't quite remember it. If we, someone else can talk. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I, I, I've, I've, I've had you some. Any, do you have any there's trivia? Some trivi- I want to know if there's any trivia about this movie. Yeah, I know well, so little see. about it other than having watched it. So yeah, 
there's very little like behind the scenes sort of interest behind this stuff because apparently as a as maybe uh, opposed to many of the other films we talked about here not a lot of drama behind the scenes <laughs> apparently Fred Zinnemann was very happy with the how smoothly the, this whole production went it was over in 12 weeks uh, he calls it the easiest movie he's ever made thanks to the extraordinary caliber of the crew the actors and actresses and the way they all work together of course you're getting you know some seasoned stage actors on here they're not you know snorting coke and stuff like that and having affairs they're, on they're sets. not going to the getting a dime bag from crafty they are not they're <laughs> not doing that used uh, to be let's see. my sources tell me that you used to be able to go do that on set you used to be able to go get the dime bag from the craft services are you <laughs> legally allowed to reveal your sources <laughs> Yeah, people. I part, would, yes, because it doesn't happen anymore. Oh, it's fair. That's a great point. <laughs> um, as Tucker pointed out, yes, Paul Schofield or Fred Zinnemann uh, insisted that Paul Schofield get the role of Thomas More because he originated it on the stage, and uh, he uh, he eventually did win Best Actor for this. I can get into the wins and noms as well. Paul Schofield was actually not present at the Oscar ceremony, believing oh. that the Oscar would instead go to Richard Burton in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Uh, when movie. he won, they had to. They had to ship the award to him, and it eventually got broken tra- broken in transit, Aww. so that's unfortunate. Uh, it, but it's also one of the uh, only four productions to win Best uh, best Play at the Tonys and Best Picture. Wow. Uh, the, other, the others being My Fair Lady, The Sound of Music, and Amadeus. Okay. That's the bang. Uh, it also uh, won um, the Golden Globe for Best Picture Drama and the BAFTA for Best Film. So, or ba- ba- BAFTA for Best Film and Best British. So, this movie has not did not go unnoticed in its time, but I, I think we would all agree that this movie has since gone unnoticed largely yes. in, in the cultural mm-hmm. sphere. And and for me, I feel like that's a combination of, of I mean, in my opinion, this film not being particularly interesting, but because it feels very of its time, but in my opinion, not in a very great. When we're talking about the the more static camera work and and the slower pacing, the lack of score, these are things that were indicative of some of the films in this time period. But it's the ones that step away from that that we mm-hmm. continue to remember. I mean, the films of this year that that we people do remember are something like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which really strips down its its uh, concept to be very focused. It's it's Black Girl. It's Persona. It's Daisy. It's, it's the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. These these mm-hmm. the Battle of Algiers. What movie comes that... out in sixty seven? Oh God, dang it! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it like, it, it's films that that subvert what films like this are doing. The ones that stick around, and because of that, I felt like I was watching a film that doesn't do anything. At least for me, for as as a modern viewer, I'm I'm scraping for more energy out of these performances. I'm scraping for a little better explanation and understanding of these characters. I want a little more from that cinematography and especially the score. And that led, led me to, uh, for not the first time in Quest history, for, but for the first time in a while, struggling, fighting for my life to maintain engagement in this film. And it does pick up a little bit at the end, but I was, I, I think this movie is boring as sin, as I said to Tanner mm-hmm. as the movie wrapped up last night. I, I was really disappointed in this film, and I just don't know if uh, you guys make good points about about Thomas More about these political themes that I think you can infer from some of the dialogue. Maybe I wasn't mentioned enough to. Uh, I, I will readily admit, um, but I feel like this is the film I would get the least out of going back to it, and the film I would be the least entertained by going back to. Like, frankly, I would rather w- rather watch Crash again. Because I feel like that's a more entertaining, <laughs> it's a more interesting film to watch, at least in my opinion. Because it's a fucking disaster. All right, I, let's see here. I, I, I got some wins and noms just before just oh, before yes, we yes. Uh, continue doing our, our, our closing thoughts, I suppose. Uh, so obviously this film won Best Picture. Uh, won Best Actor, again, uh, for Paul, Paul Schofield, not present at the ceremony. Uh, Fred Zinnemann won Best Director. Uh, it won Best Adapted Screenplay for the uh, play written by Robert Bolt. It won best cinematography, best costume design. It was, and the other, 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 other two actors nominated for this film were Robert Shaw for actor in a supporting role and Wendy Hiller for actress in a supporting role. Mm-hmm. And Wendy Hiller was uh, Alice. Yeah, I mean, those costumes. Am I right? Deserving of the an costumes. award. They're very good. Yeah, 
I, I don't know. You, it's a period piece. This is like a gimme for the, yeah. the Oscar for best costumes. My uh, um my one closing thought is that perhaps so we have to I think about the context of this film. It's the sixties. It's also a British film. British history. What was going on with Edward for with Henry the Eighth and Oliver Crom or no? I guess this is a Thomas Cromwell's different exactly. than Oliver Cromwell. I was, was going to say that Timo is that uh, you said you said Cromwell is an interesting person. I'm like I think you're probably thinking of Oliver Cromwell. Why are who is the the English Civil War guy? So who clearly, a lot <laughs> yes. There's there's uh, there's many layers to English history that perhaps Too American audience is not super well suited to understand, given that it's you know we don't learn about this in school. Um, and so that, but but back in the time that those, uh, just these characters and the events prob probably were more well known and at least um, a little bit more, at least people had a, probably some ideas, even if they didn't know specifically um, in the 60s. I just think that nowadays, not people just, I don't know, way less interest in this period of English history um, today than back then. And that's definitely mm -hmm. something I feel on a personal who else we got? That we it, got Timo? a couple other people yeah. who want to finish up here. <laughs> I, I, Timo, do, Timo, do you have, did you want to uh, continue your closing thoughts, or is that, is that I is think that it? I think my my closing thoughts okay. have have shuttered their doors for good. Okay. Um. I mean, I, if I were to give my closing thoughts on this film, is that I spent a lot of this episode sort of uh, lauding it with with lots of with lots of um praises and, and things like that. Uh, thank you. Uh. And I, I mean, I believe in all the uh, in all those things I said, but I I I, I feel you weren't perjuring yourself. <laughs> I was not perjuring myself, but Contempt. maybe just to preempt my score a little bit here, I believe all those things I said. I I do think that Thomas More is a well written character in this film. I believe that Paul Schofield uh, delivers a good performance in here. But if you were to weigh the entirety of this film, I'm not sure that it weighs up so well against some of the other ones we have on this list because i can totally understand why you know uh B B abram and tucker might not have been as as engaged by this why they found it a little boring as i said i don't think the film really gets going until robert shaw shows up as henry the eighth and that's 40 minutes into the film and that's a that's a huge detriment it, it lacks visual flair and things like that but i think what it does have is well written and well executed dialogue scenes. You know, it's a bit, um, a bit Sorkian, maybe proto Sorkian sort of script here, uh, where we have witticisms being thrown back and forth. I think I think it's very when we get in those scenes, those scenes are tight. They are fun. The the little dialogue jabs are fun to you know listen to do, listen to be delivered and sort of decode and like how how they are undercutting each other in in sort of uh, backhanded British dry wit ways. Um, so yeah, I I would say that um, I, I I it seems that uh, for the people who remember a man for all seasons, they remember it fondly, and I can I can see why in a lot of ways because with the power structures that are being analyzed here, I think that maybe they aren't as uh, maybe they aren't as powerful and you know important as as we as they were back in the 1960s, but at the same time, maybe they are, because as we just saw, the entire British royal family was just thrown in sort of, into sort of upheaval with the death of Queen Elizabeth II, and that it sort of came back into the public consciousness, the idea of this power structure, which was, at the time, and maybe why I am interested in, in this class that I'm in right now, uh, was, like, the most powerful Western uh, power structure alongside the Catholic Church, and seeing a story with a single man caught in between these two things is just interesting on its face to me, and it's well executed, I believe, in A Man for All Seasons. Abram? I thought there weren't enough superheroes. <laughs> oh, okay, all on. right. Okay, point. <laughs> God. Let's do our scores. I know what mine is. Mine... Is it in a box? It's mine, in, the... mine in a box? I did. Yeah. Tanner was oh, in box. God, I'm putting mine in my box. He's got it. Tanner's box is getting filled. Okay. <sighs> Is God, it ever? You know it. Is it ever? All uh, right. Let's find out Ready? what this film gets in three, two, one. Ding. Wow. Tanner and I are almost of singular mind. Okay, the average score is 5.4. The point breakdown goes from the top to the bottom. Tanner gave it a 6.6. .6. I gave it a 6.4. Abram gave it a 5.1. And then Tucker gave it a 3.3. So could you have seen that coming? I think yes. 
<laughs> I think that's pretty much exactly where I predicted it would end up. 5.4. Right. Let's investigate. A little bit. A little bit of a, a tiebreaker here. We got to oh figure boy. out. And it's a little oh, bit geez. of a British movie tiebreaker here. We have to decide whether A Man for All Seasons goes above or below Chariots of Fire. What uh, say I'm ye? Put it the, I'm going to put it above Chariots of Fire because I'm hard-pressed to remember anything about Chariots of Fire. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> and I just think that uh, the, the, the things I will remember, I will remember things about this film. I'll remember the positives of this film for sure. I think I agree with you, Tanner. I will put this above Chariots of Fire in that I think moment to moment I just liked watching this film a little bit more and Chariots of Fire was also boring. <laughs> so <laughs> kind yeah, of good no. kind of good partners right next to each other. No, mm. I'm putting Chariots of Fire above this. Now I do recognize that my score for Chariots of Fire is zero point two points below, but as I say ad nauseum, I don't think about my scores at all. And uh -huh. I, if if Chariots of Fire and what's the movie called Man for All Seasons are both falling off of a, off the side of a cliff and I can only grab no. one of them. Yeah. Most likely I'd just say eh, and grab neither. But if, I, <laughs> oh, sure. but if I had to, I'd grab Chariots of Fire because when I think about Chariots of Fire, I do think back on that. The Vangelis score, I can't turn my my, my webcam. I can move my webcam. And I think about how much I love Blade Runner. Look at that. Uh, Blade Runner. <laughs> There's Blade um, Runner. Some interesting cinematography for class. <laughs> yeah, and, and I just I just think about I think about sort of more stylistic moves that were compelling about that when i think about the running sequences are they hokey yes but there's a sort of spirit there that i did enjoy i like the score a lot and they're both ostensibly period pieces and if i had to go back to one of them i'd be more compelled to go back to that olympic setting so i'm gonna I say love... chariots of fire I, of Abram, course. I just love that. I just want to say that I love whenever Chariots of Fire gets brought up. You're like, you know what? I'm going to vote for Chariots of Fire because it reminds me of a different movie that I like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, by association. Yeah, exactly. I guess. Tucker, what are you gonna? What, what are you gonna put? Uh, a Man for All Seasons above or below Chariots of Fire? Definitely below Chariots yeah. of Fire for, for pretty much the same reasons that Abram mentioned. Uh, is that I do think it does something interesting style. Wait, 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 wait. Let's be clear. Are you putting it above Chariots of Fire? No. Did I say okay. that? No, you didn't. I don't know. Abram, you didn't say that. No, but but you said you for the all the reasons that I did, my reasons are for putting Chariots of Fire above this movie. Yes. I'm, exactly. yeah, he's doing the same. Yeah, he's doing the same thing. Thank you. I just I just I want to clarify yeah. on behalf of the audience. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. And, and unlike Abram, I think about my scores. In this movie, I have two full points lower. I mean, I was so disconnected and disappointed with many aspects of this film, and, and I think it extends to reasons that I can't necessarily fully explain that I maybe need to think a little bit more on this film, but I don't expect myself to, is I was, I was even disappointed by some of the performances and the writing. I really didn't think it, it hit me as hard as, as I would have wanted it to, which is disappointing. Because when you tell me we've got a movie about uh, a dynasty changing the power structure, I'm like, oh, that sounds more interesting than two guys running. Um, but the two guys running movie did a lot more stuff interesting in terms of, in terms of its filmmaking. Uh, and in this film, I, I did I fall asleep during Chariots of Fire? I don't think so. But I definitely did fall asleep during this movie. Uh, you did. So that, if that's a line, then boom, this definitely goes below. So that leaves it up to the audience. It might. Right. Shall, should we leave it yeah, up to we, the audience? Uh, well, d d do the do the scores come out uh, any different if you extend it all the way out past the first decimal point there, oh, Timo? I think oh, I think it's more fun to leave it to the audience. None of us. Okay. Are gonna all acquiesce. right. All right. So I think we just. I will Basically, say Dan's John we, Tor. we extend the decimal point out and they're still very, very close within point okay. oh three points of each other. That's like, you know, three hundredths. Um, it is. So that's Something that's like within that. the margin of the audience can decide. Yeah. So okay. let us know in the comments, which one do you think is better or the better best picture winner? You can choose which metric you're going by. Chariots of Fire or A Man for All Seasons. I look forward to seeing your responses next week. And you but know also next week. But also next week, let's spin that <laughs> MF wheel, baby. <gasps> Woo! It's wheel time. It's wheel oh, time. God, yeah. yeah. It's wheel time. Yeah. Okay, Tanner. They wheel now. <gasps> in your best um they wheel now. In your best impression of Edward the Eighth. Edward the Eighth. I don't know if, I don't even know if that's a guy. Why do I keep in, thinking in my... Henry VIII is Edward VIII? This is I I, I, know, I almost said that earlier, but I caught myself, and this time it just well Edward is his son. 
Just, just, uh, just so you know. Oh, huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, whatever. Get us going. <sighs> wheel, wheel. What's your deal? Give us a movie that makes us squeal. Is it on digital? Is it on real? Wheel, wheel. What's your deal? The wheel's deal is as we creep ever closer to the end of the list. Number nine. God. Out of 15 films this time, we are getting dangerously low on films. Tanner, have I ever told you? Have I ever told you how much I dislike this sort of huh? Wheel, what's going on that you ended on? Oh, I don't. You don't. You don't like how I do? I'm casual with it. It's too casual. It's too casual. Playful. We need to re. We need to reestablish the 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 hierarchy. The wheel is our ruler, and we are its humble servants. Mm -hmm. Well, I sure hope that we don't have a power. We'll have to. (laughs) I sure hope that we don't have a playful film to watch this week. I guess. Uh well. Uh, we've got a film directed by Robert Wise, and okay. starring a couple people here. We got Christopher Plummer, Plummer. We got Eleanor Parker, Richard Hayden, Peggy Wood, Charmian Carr, and Julie Andrews. Uh, oh, we'll watch oh. Sixty-five, best picture winner. Only going back one year. Sound of Music. Sound of Music. The, the other one. Alive, I believe, with the Sound of Music. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll do a little singing for you all on the next episode. Oh. I, I one of huh? seventy five minutes. <laughs> okay, okay, that's a it, it's a long one, but it's a classic. You know, that's a classic one. So is this. This is classic, in some ways, and in other ways. Mm-hmm. It's not. <laughs> it's not a classic. <laughs> well, Timo said in some ways it's classic, and then in other ways. Oh, okay. It's not. At, I was wait, finishing well, a sentence. Well, well, let's spice up this conversation a little bit. How many of you guys have seen The Sound of Music before? I have not. You've I've not? seen. Like two, the two scenes that they show in film school every year, which is about the coming of sound. They show those two in the movie theater in the in the screening room where the, all the old movie guys are like, "Ah, this will never work." They show that scene like every year for some reason. I've seen yeah. that scene a bajillion times, and I haven't seen the rest of the film. Yeah, Parker. Uh, I've probably seen this multiple times, but I don't remember anything about it. Um, I did live with one of the cast members of The Sound of Music for like a year and a half of my life, so I've been impacted. By the sound of music, Charmian Carr was a family friend uh, of my parents. She she passed away a few years ago, but I I lived at her house during Hurricane Katrina when I was six years old. Um, uh, so wow. I, this movie has impacted me, but I don't yes. care about this movie at all. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I I have also seen this. I don't remember anything about it because I watched it in middle school music class for sure. Uh, so probably so, jumped, jumped up into bits. <laughs> yeah, we watched. We probably watched this over the course of a week. So we'll see. <laughs> I I hope I like it. This is a favorite of a uh, one quest fan, Seth Householder. So that'll be that'll be fun to revisit. Yeah, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure he'll he'll give us his thoughts on this film uh, yes. when we get around to it. And it it is one of the few remaining musicals on the list. We're yes. almost done with the quest musical, the subgenre unto itself. There really isn't anything better, though, Tanner, than a movie in class that takes up two weeks. I remember my teacher had us watch JFK, but it was a scratch DVD copy from the library. So we'd uh-huh. get like 10 minutes in and it would start freezing. And you'd hear him from the back of the room go, <sighs> <laughs> and he would stand yeah. up and take his tie to, wa- to wipe it off. So. <laughs> Makes, I'm sure that movie. didn't help it being a scratch. But there's who, just you know who am I to say? There's just no, there's just nothing like enjoying a movie over five 45 minute <laughs> increments. Yeah. All right. Well, well, we'll probably enjoy this one in one sitting. I yeah, will we'll see. We'll see. And you can enjoy Quest in one sitting too, if you do. If you do, uh, I don't know. If you watch, watch it at once. Yeah, you just watch mm-hmm. the whole thing. Just turn it on, and, and then it's over before you know it. Thank you guys for joining me to talk about this movie, A Man for All Seasons. We got to see some seasons in the film, mostly summer and winter. There was the one montage shot, so I guess that's where the title comes from. Um, mm-hmm. A good discussion we had here. I thought we raised some interesting points and our, our little headbutting provided some interesting further insights, at least for me. Um, and so I thank I thank ye for that. How would how would how would I say that if I was talking to the King King Henry? I don't know, whatever. It doesn't matter. I thanketh ye for that if Exactly. And so until next time, I doth wish you peace. Farewell.